Welcome back, everyone. Um, if you didn't see it in the chat, I want to know how you're all feeling. Give me one word of how you're coming into the space we're in the second half of this training. And I've heard so far from Christine, she says she feels hot, like literal hot because the weather is hot or something else. And then um, Kasua put full. Anybody else? How are you feeling coming into this training? Anybody nervous? Just a little bit. Okay. We promise we will be kind <laughs> during the training. Excited. I love it. Literally, Fresno is hot in the summer. Oh my goodness, I bet. Okay. So we have a pretty packed day and we want to be able to give you as much time to workshop your story. So I'm just going to go ahead and just keep moving on. Hungry. What's going on? Joshua, you need to eat. <laughs> we don't want you to be hangry. Okay. Get something to eat. <laughs> All right. So we're curious, what are some insights that you got from the last training? So what has been the biggest aha, whether it was during the first part of the training in your own reflection afterwards, or as you were working through the workbook, what is an aha that you got from the last time that we all gathered? Put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself as well. quiet out there what's going on folks <laughs> or what questions do you have How about that okay well let's just go ahead and we'll move on so again we want to know what your insights are your questions so we have one objective today we want all of you to be able to identify your story and some potential ways that you could apply it to your work, or maybe even personally, how are you able to tell more stories? So I'm gonna kick it over to Dawn and she will lead us in a quick review. Awesome, thank you for that, Noilin. Welcome everybody to the second session. Uh, so this session is really gonna be about you all and giving us the opportunity to hear how is your story working how might it be applied to different audiences? Um, and what might we be able to do to, to tweak it, right? So we're gonna be opening up the floor for a lot of you today. So I'm giving you some time to reflect back on any story. Um, and the way that we're gonna get into story is by kind of sticking into a moment. <clears throat> now keep in mind that any moment from our lives can be, um, can be thought about in many different ways. And any moment from our lives can be articulated in, in, in what it meant in terms of the change. So the change statement for anything that we do in storytelling is really gonna be the crux of where the story lies, right? So, um, so as you're thinking about your moment, like a moment that I'll never forget, or a moment that things changed for me, um, or um, a moment that I um, escaped from a, a bad habit or a social circle, right? Whenever we think about that moment, we wanna think about who we were before and who we were after. Now, the way that you can think about this is a couple of different ways. You can think about this from an internal shift. So internally, you know, I, I changed my mind about something. I realized that I needed to be a better advocate or I needed, that I needed to, to stand up or I realized that I need to change, right? So one angle to think about when we're looking at um, our change statement, is what changed specifically for you? Okay, but what changed specifically for you? The second way to think about your change statement is what changed relative to my relationship to other people, other people that are part of my story. So how did my relationship with uh, this person change? Or how did my relationship with my brother, my sister, my boss, my coworker, um, how did that change based off of this one moment? And the third way to think about this is what changed in terms of my worldview? So um, when we think about our worldview, we could think about what change in terms of like my politics or what change in terms of the way that I think about my culture or what, how, what changed the, the way that I think about women or men or gender identity, right? So these broader topics. So 
Um, so I'd love to do uh, just a quick, uh, a couple of insights to, to hear what's kind of coming up from you. In your story, you go from what to what? So for example, in my own story, um, uh, many of you might know, I think I mentioned this last, last time that I did a TED talk about, um, about my relationship with my twin brother. Um, and in that story, I went from thinking that I was the one who would need to, to show him the way to support him. And I realized that actually he was the one who was providing a lot more insights in a way that I never imagined, okay? And, if, and once we have that, the framing of the story, then we can start to put it into its, its, um, its, its natural framework. So first off, I would just like to like open the floor and see like what is either the moment that you're leaning into or what are you going to and from? What is the change statement? And you can just do it in a sentence, a couple sentences, uh, but I'd love to hear what is popping up for you all. So let's go ahead and get a couple of examples. Um, who has something that they would like to share? And let's see, I'm also jumping into the chat, but feel free to take yourselves off of mute. Is it uh, Kashoa? Hi. Um, so I will complete this sentence. And um, in this story, I go from uh, staying silent um, to speaking up. Great. So can you give us a little bit more context about what it looked like for us to see you being silent? Like what was uh, what was happening in terms of your own um, identity or what was happening? Yeah. Yeah. Um, do I share this, the story with, with everyone? Yeah, why don't you go ahead and share um, a longer version of the story because I think it would also help to, to demonstrate um, um, a how we could do the review rather quickly mm -hmm. and what that looks like in terms of a larger story. And it might also give some people some time to think about what story they might want to share today as well. So yeah, why don't we go ahead and share that story? Sure. Okay. So this is a personal story of mine. This is while I was still in college and um, I was waiting tables part-time. Um, I started out at this particular uh, restaurant as a host. So my job as, as a host was to uh, greet guests, uh, I mean, greet uh, restaurant goers and then take them to seats. And then a part of my job was also to inform um, servers uh, when I see their first table of the shift. Um, and um, I quickly, this is my first job in the, in the food industry. Um, and I quickly noticed that um, servers reacted to uh, different tables that I sat them differently based on their skin color. And that was something that I picked up really quickly, particularly um, guests who were black, who were not uh, received as enthusiastically as um, other guests of different colors. And so this is something that I took note of. And this is me, I, I was around maybe 19 or 20 then, I really didn't know how to react to it or how to um, go about addressing it with anyone really. Um, and this was blatantly um, very evident in the entire restaurant. And so I felt like um, I had managers and supervisors who were witnessing these uh, reaction and nothing was being done about it. Um, and so I let that kind of go for a, a year or so before I had I moved up to be a server. Um, and there was, I remember this particular day, um, for this particular restaurant, we are only allowed to serve four tables at one time to really ensure that uh, we were giving good service to all of our uh, restaurant goers that came by. And so each of us had a four table section. Um, I had all four tables in my particular section, I had four tables completely filled up. I was then sat a fifth table because once we get busier, uh, we're, uh, sometimes we get a fifth table. My fifth table included uh, a family of seven. And so I quickly got drinks for them. Um, and while I was really busy in the back preparing drinks for my 
fifth table, the host at the, the front came by and told me to take care of another table, which would make that my sixth table uh, from across the, across the, 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 rest, the restaurant that was completely out of my section. And when I had looked over, um, I had walked up actually when I had walked up to the host stand and um, at the host stand we have a computer that tracks when these tables are sat. And so I noticed that table has been sitting there for 10 minutes as servers were supposed to get to the tables within five minutes of the of the guests being sat. And then I noticed that at this table, there was four, four ladies um, at the table and there were four black ladies. And so I had noticed that that section belonged to one of the servers that when I was ho a host, I knew that she was not particularly found, uh, found of, of people of dark, darker skin complexion. And so I have also observed too that she had um, only two tables and the table that, uh, were, that the host had asked me to serve was her third table. And so I had went up to the host and asked why I was being asked to take care of a table that was out of my section that was in another server section and the server did not meet, reach her four table limit yet. Um, the, the host told me that uh, the server just looked at her and told her that she wasn't going to take care of that table. And, and at that moment, um, there was a lot of feelings going through my head. I, for one, know the history of um, how this server treated um, restaurant goers of that skin color. And then two, also feeling like my, um, my kindness and my patience was being taken advantage of because um, I knew that the host would rather just give me the table than deal with the, the other server. Um, that was the first time I ever, uh, raise my voice, you know, at, uh, at work. Um, I got really emotional and um, I marched back through the kitchen and to my manager's office. And I told the manager of the situation and I was, um, you know, I had to be very selective of my words uh, and letting the manager know that this is what I think is going on. And this is all my assumption, but this is why I have arrived at this assumption. And um, the manager had checked to see if, to see how far along on the manager's computer, they can check to see how far along uh, each of the tables are. And she, the, my manager, she had, um, noticed that the other two tables that were sat in that particular service uh, section were already checked out, meaning they've received their drinks, their food, and they were already checked out. They have already paid and they were just sitting at the table. That means that that server had no other table except for the one table that she refused to serve. And so uh, my manager assured me that she would take actions and I was given the rest of the night off because I was so upset. We made sure that the ladies were served before I had left. And the next day I arrived to find out that um, that server was fired because she had no explanation to why she could not serve that particular table other than the fact that um, uh, the fact that it was four tables of you know black women and there was no other reasons she couldn't serve them. And she had refused service to um, restaurant goers. And so um, I felt really supported actually um, in, in that matter because um, my manager took action immediately. Um, my manager also let me know that um, she did not share how she received this information, meaning that my name was not mentioned. Um, in the past, uh, before this event, um, this mentor and I, we, we had a very casual, I mean, we had a really just professional relationship where she was a tough manager. And so um, our relationship was just, you know, just strictly business oriented. But after this incident, I, I saw that, um, you know, she was somebody that um, uh, 
was supportive of her employees and and uh, you know also had a moral a moral compass as well, and 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 so I um, you know from this this experience I went from being staying silent. Um, all those years to finally break my silence and speaking up because I really thought to myself, too, how unfair it is that someone can come to a restaurant and not be served. And I just can't help think of, you know, my own, my own, my own sisters, my own mothers, if they were to go out to a restaurant and not be served based on their skin color, how upset I would be. And so, uh, that's really changed me in terms of um, speaking up and also advocating for communities of color, particularly. Um, and this has been, kind of been kind of like the, um, I want to say the groundwork for why I am in the field I, I am in currently. Thank wow. you. Awesome. That's a I mean, a riveting story and very, very clear. Like we could, we could sense the scenes so clearly, mm -hmm. like seeing you in the restaurant, being new to this job and, and kind of understanding that, you know, we can say a lot with our words when, um, when we um, are, are in that space where, you know, we basically were just like, you know, I was, um, um, we set up the, the precedence for people at a table uh, or excuse me, four uh, four tables at a time, and this would have been your fifth one, and now your sixth one, right? So we start to see the stakes in terms of like why why is this happening, um, and then the result, right? So I think that you do an excellent job of like setting the the scene for us to let us know like what's happening, um, as well as the emotion. So okay. you know, I really commend you for for a for for standing up. Um, B for being the, the first person to share your story as part of today's share, which is awesome. It's always like, you know, like I'm going to give you a, a firecracker here for being the first to, to share your story. Oops, it just went away. There we go. Awesome. Um, and, um, and yeah, so, and is your name, is it Kash Kashua? It's Kashua. Kashua. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So as Kashua was talking about her story, you know, there's so many different ways that, you know, you could have potentially framed the story. So this is, I'm the opening up the, to, to the floor, um, but essentially, you know, this could have been a, a story about her relationship with her manager. You know, before I, my manager, I thought was, was somebody who um, was not um, all for diversity, equity, inclusion, or even hearing you. And afterwards I realized that they were you know, so it could have been a story about a relationship with the same kind of crux in the middle, you know, mm -hmm. or it could be a story about this is a time that I went from um, possibly, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but possibly being a little bit more naive about the way that Black women or people of color are treated um, to understanding fully because it happened right in front of my face, right? Or even a story about how she changed. And what I was hearing a lot from the story was that she started seeing that this was something that she needed to act on and something that later led to her involvement, activism, and speaking out, right? It's a personal change. So that's a great way to set this up. Um, so round of applause for your story. Excellent, excellent. Um, so that, that's essentially what we're gonna be doing today, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're gonna open the floor like three minutes at a time. Uh, we're first gonna ask, you know, like what, was, what did you go to and from in your story? Um, and we'll do a little bit of a review as well of you know, how to actually find those moments and then kind of go back into our story arc. Do most people remember the story arc? Narrative arc? Yeah. Can't see many hands because my screen is a little bit wonky. Um, but let's do a little, uh, okay, great. I see you, Christine. Um, and while I review um, this narrative arc structure for just a moment, um, keep in mind that we're gonna come to you in just a moment with some, with some more stories. So if this is a, a new thing for you, don't worry, we got your back. We're totally, we're totally here to like help support you craft your story and to pull it out, um, to ask some questions if it needs clarification. Uh, and this is also an opportunity for you, the people who are in the audience to also ask questions. 
because you'll notice that as you start to develop your stories and something that is a question for me might also be a question for Norlin. It might also be a question for Tracy or for Christine um, or, you know, like Joshua, the people that we have in the room. So feel free to ask those questions and then we'll continue going on to the next person. Okay. So just a quick review of narrative arc. Um, we always have some type of structure to the story. So Kashua, if I were to ask you, what was the moment that you were reflected on? Where did this story start for you? Like, what was that trigger moment for you? Um, you mean in terms of me remembering the story or? Yeah. yeah. Um, let me see. I think it's the confrontation, the me having to be confrontational, sort of, um, because prior to that, it, it was really hard for me to uh, be confrontational at all. And so it's just that feeling, it's something that I go back to every right now and then to um, reflective on like, where I came from, how far I've come. And so would you say, was it that moment that um, when you actually went to your manager and stood up for yourself, that was a kind of like that, that, first, that first thought? Or was it the moment that the woman told you that she wasn't going to serve the other table? Um, what, what moment do you think? First yeah, yeah, definitely. I think once um, when, I, when I had went up and, and saw on the, on the computer that um, the server had no other, had only two other tables and then realizing the reason of why I was being asked to take care of that table instead of the other server. Okay, great, great. So this is a perfect example of like, what do you do when you have like this moment? Cause she was an example, you know, she, she, she's remembering back this moment where she goes, she sees that there's a whole bunch of opportunities for this other server to be working these tables, but they're not, right? And so typically in the mind's brain, these moments live somewhere in the middle of the story, right? So in order for the rest of the story to make sense, we need a little bit of the backstory, the setup, sometimes maybe in the, the inciting incident. And then we need the end of the story, the resolution and or the climax, depending on where exactly this moment lives, right? So, you know, we, we did a great, excellent job of setting up, A, your emotions in terms of that typically I was not the kind of person to speak out. I was new to the job. Uh, so we kind of like set the scene. Then we get to this moment that we're remembering and then we get to the resolution, mm. right? So every story, every good story has this element of change. And when we're doing storytelling for advocacy or storytelling for any type of like leadership potential, we wanna see that people can change. We wanna see that I can change, my community can change, we can change, right? So that's why it's always important to think about what we've been through in terms of the beginning and the end of our stories. Does that make sense? So the five beats, just to recap the setup. So people, place, times, like basic context for where we're starting, inciting incident, something that happens that sets the story in motion. The raising of the stakes. So like we see the protagonist in, in trying to figure things out, but it hasn't quite been figured out yet. Our climax, um, which is kind of like where the something's about to break and go the other direction. And then finally our resolution. Okay. So let's keep it going with some more stories. Um, who would like to try something next? Ah, there we go. Uh, yeah, great. Is it, uh, Carisha? Carisha? Great. I think you're still on mute. Yes. Awesome. Oh, actually, one, one, one quick thing. Um, I'm going to time us so that we have enough uh, time and room for as many people as we'd like. So what I'm going to do is I will start to lift my phone up when it's about the three minute mark, which just means like don't don't speed up or anything like that. It just means like, you know, gently find your way to a to a nice landing so we can open the floor and discuss. OK, great. So I just pick a, a story. Or... Yeah, any story that you would like to, uh, to, 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 to share. Okay. 
I was having pains one time, like I was having pains and the pains escalated into um, me uh, starting to vomit. And so I was feeling sick. And so I went to the doctors. I went to the doctors and they rushed me to the emergency room said that I was pregnant. And so I went and got a pregnancy test and found out I was pregnant, but they could barely see the baby, but they didn't know what was wrong with me, only to find out that I was borderline having a, a heat stroke as well as I was pregnant. And then to further investigate, they found out that I was pregnant with two babies. One baby was in the fallopian tube and one was in the cervix. So I went to the hospital. I went through the whole process as the hospital directed me to have to prep for surgery. So I went into surgery and 10 days later, they told me that they were taking both of the babies because it was an emergency necessity. At the time, they didn't know how to go about it. So that's why it took so long. So once they gave me the surgery and they told me, you're, gonna, you're not gonna have any babies. We're gonna have to take both babies because it's a medical necessity and the babies have no survival rate. So I went back to the hospital three months later after the surgery and found out that I was still pregnant. I was five months pregnant at that time. But when I went in to speak with triage, no one believed me. They wanted to call mental health because they thought that I was crazy. So it wasn't until I lifted up my shirt and showed them my stomach with this baby inside for me rumbling around. I'm at that moment, I felt like I was having a surreal moment, like, like out of the body experience. And so I asked them if they could get me in the back so that I can have them do a sonogram to see what was inside of me if I wasn't pregnant. So when they got back there, when I got in the back with triage and they sent me to go get a, um, what do you call it? <laughs> when I went and got a sonogram, sonogram. the, uh, the doctor was like, Whoa, this baby is full fledged, like a real live baby. And like, it was like no medical terms at all. Cause everybody was like in awe, like everyone had lost their mind, including myself. And so I went back and waited while they transferred me to the maternity side of the hospital only to come across one of the surgeons that did my surgery. And she started yelling at me like, you're not pregnant. I did your surgery. We took both babies. And then she told me to lay down. She was gonna do an exam and put gloves on and rammed her hands inside of me. So I thought that I was gonna lose the baby that I just currently found out that I was pregnant with. So I told her, thank you, but no, thank you for your services. You're wrong. I'm right. I know my body. I went, I, I then went to the administration department of the hospital, requested for all my documents, because at that point, I told, told myself that I was not coming back to the hospital for any services. And so after I uh, picked up all my documents and stuff, I went to a different hospital, only for them to tell me to go back to the same hospital that I just received all this trauma for. And so from that point forward, I just stuck with myself and um, gathered a, a medical team and um, that would help me further my agenda and making sure my baby came home safe. And she's three years old now and she's my miracle baby. Wow. Oh my gosh. Round of applause. Go ahead and take yourselves off of mute, ladies and gentlemen. A round of applause for, wow. I mean, talk about a patient advocacy story, right? Woo. So my gosh. Um, uh, so tell us a little bit about like how you, what was the, I mean, of course, this is a story I'm sure you've carried with you for a long time, but when you were kind of coming up with the prompt and like why this story, was there a particular moment or a particular reason why you wanted to bring this one to life? Well, I work in the maternity health field now because of this story. I realized that with my experience, there's been other women who've experienced the same experience, maybe greater or worse or less than, but similar to. So I felt like it was up to me to 
encourage and empower and advocate on others' behalf that didn't have those tools. And so tell us a little bit more about the, the tools that you pe wish that people would have now that you've lived through it and what you hope that others will learn as a result of the story. Well, I'm learning that we, as a community, we need advocates because when you're talking to medical providers, there's such a great disconnect in communication. It's like they're speaking a foreign language. And so if you don't have someone there to even say like, hey, can you slow down? Can you repeat that? Can you break that down? Can you please refrain from keeping us in that 10 minute time frame due to billing? So I just feel like it's, it's greatly needed because it's like it translated. And so when you say well, that, that we need advocates, you, do you mean advocates, people that will talk to um to doctors or people that will know how to stand up for their rights? What exactly does that look like to you? Advocacy um, is good in any field. So I feel like specifically the medical field, it's great to have an advocacy nurse there that understands the information, but also to an individual that just understands the information that may be retired or have some type of experience in that work field. Great, great. Remind me real quick, is your name, is it Karesha? It's Karisha. Karisha, okay, great. Who here can, can relate with Karisha's uh, story? Just go ahead and like, either like raise your hand or take yourself off of mute or give me a thumbs up or a yes in the chat if you can relate with uh, this particular story. Great. So for anybody who either raised your hand or said a yes, uh, tell me why. What was it that, that stood out to you was there something that was overlapping, perhaps a, a similar narrative, or you just kind of resonated with the possibility of having a child and needing an advocate? What was it for you that, that stood out in terms of uh, this particular story? I'm going to jump in <laughs> as a co-facilitator here. Um, first of all, Karisha, thank you so much. I was completely drawn in to your story. So I think you're incredibly brave for sharing it. Um, what stuck out to me is when he said, I know my body and to trust yourself because you were in situations, these medical professionals were telling you something that you, that, that you realize that's actually not true. So to me, that's what actually stuck out the most. Um, I thought you, um, you painted really, really vivid imagery of what you were going through and, um, the turmoil I really feel of trying to advocate for yourself. And I see why you're doing this. So I just wanted to, to lift that up and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Noilin. For me, um, you know, it was the fact that um, I'm also a twin. And um, I know that, well, I, so I have a, a twin with special needs. Um, and growing up, I started hearing more stories about people who might want to abort um, one of those twins. Um, and so as you were sharing that, you know, at one point there were two, and I'm assuming that you ended up with one? Yes. Okay, cool, yeah. So um, so that was one of the things that it was reminding me of, of, of my own personal journey. Um, and that's exactly what happens, ladies and gentlemen, when somebody is sharing a story is that when one person is sharing a story, there's millions of other stories that are happening in the minds of the listeners, right? It's like, oh, I connected that story because of this element, or Noelin connected to it because of the motherhood element or because of the pregnancy element, right? Um, and so once we're people are drawn into that story, you're able to take them on a journey and to then say, now that you feel me, now let's talk about what this means in terms of advocacy or what does this mean in terms of, of what we should do to change it, right? So the story is a critical part of understanding people's values, people's experiences, and why it is that we stand for the things that we stand for. Does that make sense? Anybody else wanted to yes. chime in on that story before going on to the next one? This is Sarah. I, I didn't want to say that I have been on the other end of that I was the nurse that saw stuff like that happening. Um, I'm a nurse and I, my first job out of nursing school was in ICU. I wanted to be a gung-ho ICU nurse and 
thought that they were just amazing. And then doing the work as long as I did, I, I saw a, a, just a lot of judgment and a lot of um, dismissal of people. Um, you know, they were labeled frequent flyers and up oh, so-and-so's <laughs> back. And I always asked, you know, well, why are they back? Has anyone asked this question? Is anyone working with them? I mean, what, what's the story that no one wants to come to the hospital and hang out? It's not the place people want to go. Right. Uh, so there's, there's something that is not being addressed. Um, I end up leaving, you know, that part of healthcare because of, of some of the stuff I saw. So um, I, it's, it's infuriating and wish I could fix it. I want to fix it. So what do you do now, Sarah? Um, so is it something that you've pivoted into that feels more in alignment with the way that you want to fix things? Um, so yeah, I'm in community health and I, I focus on, on population health, preventative care, health education really is my main focus. Um, um, when I left the hospital, I went into working with people who had diabetes, um, coronary artery disease, who had had it sometimes for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, but never received any formal education on how to manage it, how to address the burnout, how to um, balance you know, the, the dietary and medication needs and lifestyle changes. Um, so yeah, I, and from there, I now lead a maternal child health team. And we am talk about prevention and you get them even before they're born and you know have healthier outcomes before babies are born and um, there's gonna be better health outcomes as they're adults. So I think it all kind of ties into each other. Right, it totally does. It totally does. And in a way, as you may have seen, this was like almost like a mini story, right? Yes. Talking about from beforehand, like what, what the frustration was. Um, so if you had to say it in your own words, um, what would you say was your frustration prior? And then what did that mean for you after? Uh, my frustration prior was, was the way that some patients were treated. I, honestly, the, I, there was a point that I do remember my pivoting point or that, that moment when somebody that was being transferred from the ER who attempted suicide um, was being competitive, but they were not in their right mind. And the way a nurse was talking to this person, just, it floored me, you know, telling them to, st to, to yell them to stop and act like a grown up. And this person was not in any sort of normal state of mind. And the way they were talking to him was like a three-year-old. Mm. And I'd come from mental health before that, and I just, I said, this isn't right. This is not what healthcare is supposed to be. This is not caring for people. And now I think what I do is, is really trying, is investing in people, spending time with people, getting to know them, getting to know their stories um, and working for them to meet them where they're at to, to help them have the healthiest lifestyle they can. Amazing, amazing. So I wanna play with that messy middle for just a quick second, if that's okay. Yeah. So after this incident with the ER, when you saw that, that you did not appreciate the way that they were being spoken to, um, did you say anything? Did you do anything? Did you take some time? Like what, what exactly happened before you pivoted? Um, I think I was on the edge already with, with not liking what I was doing. Um, one, comments about frequent flyers, um, Anyone who's been through nursing school knows there's a joke that nurse eat their young. It's no joke. <laughs> what? Uh, it's no joke that like new nurses get chewed up and spit out. Oh. Um, it's supposed to be a team mentality, but I never felt like I was part of a team. Felt like I was always on my own. It was very stressful work and wanted to be very good at it. Um, but just didn't have that connection. And, and sometimes I didn't want it when I saw the way that patients were treated or talked about. Mm -hmm. um, I was still a new nurse, so no, I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who to talk to. Um, I felt like there wasn't really anyone to, to talk to. I never had a mentor, never had um, anyone that, I mean, they had a, a director of the department, but not someone that I felt like I had a relationship with that would be, would be willing to listen. So 
I, I think just something clicked for me. I said, this isn't the place for me. There's, I mean, if, and you know, the interesting thing is like me now, like there's times I wish I could go back and be the me now. Cause there would be some words, there would be <laughs> some things said. Um, I was still, like I said, a new nurse. And um, I think I wish I was just insecure. And I said, I mean, I, I can't fix this. I can't, this is too much for me to fix. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to leave because this is not for me. Right. Right. And then after, did you have to do more training or did you have to just um, find a new job? I found a new job and that's when I got to start working with people with um, diabetes, like chronic conditions, chronic illnesses and working with them on health behavior changes, um, health education, connection to resources. Um, Cause you know, we all know that just giving someone education isn't always the only, the, the, the way it's not going to fix it. Sometimes they need, you know, access to resources of, to tell someone how to eat healthy all day long, but if they don't have access to healthy foods, then what's the, what's the point? Right, right. Wonderful. Thank you for that. I so appreciate that. Little fire popper cracker. There we go. <laughs> awesome. I know that those, I was pulling out some elements of the story and that totally works, uh, everyone. If you want me to, to help pull out the elements of the story with you as you share it, that's perfectly fine as well, as long as you start with a moment and we can kind of build out that moment. Um, so any other questions um, for Sarah or Karisha before we go on to the next okay. story? The type of work I do, I share my story because I work with pregnant women and I, I work with Black maternity health. I'm working on the Black maternity initiative. So how do I minimize that and paint that picture and, and not lose my audience? How do you minimize which part? The sum of the story. <laughs> How do because you decide? Go ahead. I've, I've been in settings where I've been in interviews and telling the story in a sense of sharing it because it is relevant to the work that I do. Mm-hmm. But... I don't like to come off as long-winded and I don't want to lose my audience telling the story to get to the end point, which I, within three minutes, it was kind of hard, but I didn't pay attention to it until you brought it to my attention. Great question. So if I had to ask you, what points of of this detail, if you had to tell the story in 30 seconds to a minute, um, what would you, um, I, yeah, what would you say? What details were absolutely essential for the story to make sense? Okay. Are you asking me or are you just make like think about what? No, I'm asking you, but we also, I mean, we could also take a minute to see if you could do it in a minute. Oh. <laughs> gonna put this this is like a two week process. <laughs> I'm um, gonna put the other slide back up. Maybe it'll help you. The, in the story, I go from what to what? Okay, I go from not knowing I was pregnant to being pregnant to not being pregnant to being pregnant again. It was like a a figure eight in a sense. Mm -hmm. And this story, I go from um, being vulnerable and weak to being empowered and brave. Great. So now if we had to to put more of of a scene to what it meant to be vulnerable or what it meant to be brave, um, give us a little bit more context, and this time I'm going to time it. Um, it was hard being vulnerable in a sense of health because I already have children, and they were looking to me as their strength. And so in that moment of me laying in the hospital bed, it was a, a pivotal moment for me in my life to realize that without my strength in my family, in my household, nobody will stand. So I don't know how that is being conveyed. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have, I should have clarified. So tell, share the full story again. Um, but, but this time just pull out those details that um, um, would make sense. Like say like we were in an elevator heading up to like the 20th floor. We had about a minute to, to, okay. to share the whole story. Yeah. So, so go ahead from the top of the story and um and just share with us kind of like the highlights, if you will. Okay, once I found out that I was pregnant and I had a topic pregnancy, the doctor sent me back home on meds that 
my insurance didn't cover. So I had to go back into the hospital through the paramedics. And once I got to the hospital, they discovered that um, I was pregnant with multiple babies and they needed to do an emergency uh, uh, tubal pregnancy, a tubal removal and a DNC. I don't know, I'm lost. That's okay, I'm gonna pause it for a quick second. So yeah, so what, what, one of the things that I heard that you wanna probably jump to rather quickly is the doctor telling you, hey, you're not pregnant. I already did a surgery on you. Okay. Well, I never, the, the nurses said that. The nurses pulled up my, my charts and said that I had just been uh, dismissed uh, two months prior with a, a, a DNC. And so they're the ones who read my charge. And th they were the ones that were laughing at me. And they were the ones who thought that I needed mental health services. Right. Okay, great. So what you can do is like move the timeline slightly back a bit to start off with, you know, after, um, after having a surgery because of, my, of, of the children that I thought that I was going to have and kind of start off with the surgery and then quickly kind of go into the nurse's that were laughing at you, telling you that you were crazy. Um, and then from there, going into your conclusion. Okay. So. You wanna try it one more time? Cause I was only about 30 seconds. You saying start with the surgery or start with the nurses because the nurses came before the surgery. Oh, right. So oh, yeah. wait, wait, the nurses, I'm sorry. The surgery came first. When I went back to the hospital, the nurses came second. Okay, great. That's that's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. So after having this surgery, where I was to believe that both my my twin babies were removed from my body, I I further found out later three three months later that I was still pregnant, and I went to the triage at the hospital, and the nurses did not believe me. They were in such disbelief that they wanted to call mental health on me. So is that it? Keep on going to the end of the story. Uh huh. Okay. And so it wasn't until I showed them my stomach and the baby moving around in my stomach that they believed me. And then everyone started scattering like mice, trying to get everything together, trying to call all these doctors only to find out that I was still pregnant and I was telling the truth. And from that point, everyone wanted to touch and hug me and, and they thought that I was a miracle. And this was a Catholic church I was at, so. <laughs> and what did that mean for you? Cause that was exactly one minute. I don't know. <laughs> or what did you learn from the story? What, what would you hope that people take away from the story? I hope that people learn to trust in themselves and not in others when it comes to themselves. So just look to yourself first before you look to others for help. Great, awesome. So you see how like it, it, it might take a little bit of time to, um, to, to finesse exactly how you'd make it shorter. But essentially what we're looking to do whenever we have to tell a story, what, what I'd like to do is I'd like to think about my minutes in terms of real estate, right? For a three minute story, how much time are you gonna set on the beginning? How much are you gonna spend in the middle? How much are you gonna spend at the end? For a three minute story, you don't wanna set, spend more than like 30 seconds more or less on getting into that inflection point, getting into something that happens that sets the story into motion, right? Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the story, if it's a three minute story or a five minute story, you, you don't need anything more than another 30 seconds or so to kind of like wrap it up let us know, you know, have, have you ever heard somebody say in a storytelling, you know, in, in a story, uh, you know, the moral of my story is blah, 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 right? After we kind of hit that, 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 that climax of the story, we want to rather quickly move into the conclusion, okay? So, um, but just like anything else, just like, you know, telling a story or writing a report or riding a bike or anything else, storytelling is a muscle. 
And the more that you practice the story, the more that you try telling it, um, and the more that you see like, okay, I, this time I have to do it in a minute or next time I need to do it in three minutes or in five, right? Um, the more that you continue practicing on using those minutes as your real estate, the, the easier it'll become for you to tell different versions of your story depending on your audience, right? So we're gonna talk about the audience and ways that we can shift the stories in just a moment um, after we go through like another person or two. Um, but that's a great setup for how we're actually gonna like start, start to modify things depending on the audience. So great job. Excellent, excellent. Who else would like to try to give a three minute version of a story that has come up for you? Leslie? Um, sure, I can um, try to tell my, my story <laughs> um, is pretty similar to um, the previous story actually, but it's something that I kind of um, started to think about when, um, when the first story was being told. Um, so I have a daughter, she is, um, 14 years old now, but when she, when I was pregnant, I was told that she had Down syndrome. Turns out she didn't, but she was born at 33 weeks, um, which um, is pretty early. And she had something called um, intrauterine growth restriction. So she only weighed right at three pounds. Um, we spent several months in the neonatal intensive care unit um, before she was able to come home, I think we were close to three months and she was not on bottle feeding for very long before we went home. Um, I was NICU nurse at this time. So I think that possibly played into a little bit of why she got to go home a little bit earlier because a lot of the people in the unit knew me. And so, um, I took her home I, that I'll never forget the day I took her home. Um, I knew something wasn't right. I didn't stand up for her or for myself and say that I knew that it wasn't right, took her home and um, I started feeding her and um, she quit breathing. She went limp, she turned blue um, while my other kids were in Taekwondo. And I did CPR on my daughter in the car, um, ran in, told them that I was taking my daughter to the hospital where I lived. It was much easier for me to take her. Otherwise she would have went to a hospital that didn't have um, the services she needed. So um, I put her in the car, we got to the hospital. Um, I'm surprised I didn't get pulled over. And I just ran in with this limp blue baby. Um, they took her, of course I broke down like any mom would because it was, um, it, very traumatic. And um, they said that she had one of the worst cases of aspiration pneumonia that she they had ever seen. She was um, pulling all, a, a lot of the milk that she was drinking into her lungs instead of into her stomach. Mm. So she was admitted um, shortly after we had not been there that long. They decided that they were just going to put some thickener in her feeds and send her home. This is the point where I learned that I had to stand up for her and I had to stand up for myself because it was not something that she deserved to go through. And it wasn't something that I deserved to go through again um, for something like this to happen. I knew something wasn't right. I knew it. Um, and so I pushed everybody there thought that I was crazy. I just pushed and I said, I'm not taking her home. I don't care. You guys have to do whatever you need to do. She has to go home with, with at least a monitor or something. Anyway, um, turns out I was right. She aspirated on, um, all consistency of feeds. Um, and after a, a long hospitalization and a lot of, um, tests, she was, um, given a, feeding tube in her stomach, uh, they call them a, a Mickey button, and a, a surgical procedure to kind of um, make her esophagus a little bit tighter so that she didn't um, aspirate food that she was, um, that she already had in her stomach. And um, so the moral of the story is that, um, you know, sometimes even when it's hard, you have to be able to stand up when you know um, 
it, it was definitely something that I couldn't, I couldn't put my finger on. I just knew like mother's intuition, just, I just knew something wasn't right. And, um, I think by doing that, um, at that moment is when I learned to advocate, not only for myself, I'm a nurse for my patients as well. And, um, how important that was because, um, it could have been even worse if I had not done that. Wow. Woo. Wow. My heart. Yes. I need to throw a heart at you too. Here we go. Here we go. Awesome. Wow. Have you shared this story before Leslie? Um, no, not, I mean, you know, maybe with friends or, you know, things like that, but not, not really. A lot of my friends know, a lot of my friends ask, she has a, she has a scar on her belly and she likes to wear a two piece swimsuit now that she's 14. And sometimes people ask, you know, what that's from and I Mm -hmm. tell them, but not really the whole story usually. Well, first off, I have to commend you and thank you for, for opening up and, and sharing that story. Um, because I'm sure that so many other people either um, feel you or understand the, the the angst of of being in a tough situation where you're not so sure what's going on. I'd like to know who who here related with Leslie's story, um, and and perhaps why. What what's coming up for you all as you're hearing the story, or what questions might you have uh, for Leslie uh, to help clarify the story. I'm Rosalind Burst, and I resonate with her story. Um, I also had uh, I had eight percent chance of living while carrying a child, so I really know um, how you must advocate for yourself. And no matter what the doctors say, you switch doctors. You go to another doctor because that's what I had to do. My life was on the line, 8% chance of living. I had cardiomyopathy with my heart. They said if I would have laid on the table um, in the condition I was in that I would have died. And my doctors didn't believe me. And he put me on some psych meds. So I resonate that we must advocate for ourselves and also our community um, that don't quite know how to advocate for themselves yet. Wow. So Rosalind, this was something that happened to you for you personally. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. It was it was devastating to, you know, to find out I was already a mother of um six kids. And to find out that you might lose your life. Um I had um 18 doctors and nurses around me when I delivered. I was in the hospital for two weeks. No one would take me in my city of Stockton, California. No doctors would see me and no hospital. The only hospital that agreed to see me was the county hospital. And it was only to um, check the baby with the sonogram. And that's it. Anything else, I had to go to UC Davis. And why wouldn't they see you? Because I was a high risk. Okay. You know, I, I didn't, I have never heard of a high risk, but they said I was a high risk and that's why they couldn't see me. Mm, mm. You know, and when you fight with doctors and you're telling them something wrong with me, I'm telling them something wrong with my heart. I didn't have six babies, some wrong, some wrong. Ain't nothing wrong, you know? Right, so. right. <laughs> right, there definitely seems to be a theme of today's session of people um, either not being heard or standing up for, for their rights, standing up for like something that's just not feeling right within, within us, right? And the important yeah. thing is to speak up about that. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Um, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, You're welcome. The, so much of the power of, of what we do as, as storytellers is um, it is vulnerable. It's an act of, of generosity. It's an act of vulnerability. Um, and it's also an act of moving the needle forward. 
because if people don't know our stories, if people don't know the truth, then it becomes hidden. It becomes a story that we don't, that we could have made some type of change. We could have advocated for something different. But without the story, we don't know how to act or without the story, we don't know how to change things, right? So I wanna get one more before kind of going into the section about, um, about how we take these stories and turn them into advocacy tools and some of the things that we have done already. Uh, can I get one more story? Joshua? Oh, I'm sorry, Michael. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, great. Okay, just uh, it's a little intimidating follow, following up all those great stories and uh, mine's a bit of a change of pace, but um, it's kind of the story of how I went from being, um, I guess, shelter and naive to feeling, um, to realizing my Asian Americanness and the otherness that I didn't realize existed. So um, I was a young college student and there was going through a lot. Um, it had been a tough year at school. It had been tough year like you know I'd broken up with long-term girlfriends and I needed to get out and I decided to do the uh, great American road trip and kind of just see the rest of the country and um, I did a lot of traveling that summer and I took a road trip from Southern California to Vancouver I traveled around the Midwest to visit family in Milwaukee and I went to upstate New York and um, in those experiences, if no one's ever, especially if you're an Asian American and you don't realize uh, almost how much of a privilege it is to live in such a diverse er area as like large city, Southern California, where you can't go a day without seeing another Asian, to going through other places in the U.S. and not to diminish or demean any of those other places they were beautiful and wonderful but to sit in a diner and for the first time in your right life feel eyes burrowing into the back of your head and to just receive curt service that you had thought maybe had been left many many years in the past or to be ignored and othered is an experience um, and just very eye-opening, but kind of what I, what I really felt it when I was in a diner in New York and I had been sitting down enjoying my sausages and eggs and someone comes up next to me and he, denim, denim jacket, trucker hat, all American guy, and I'm sure he meant nothing by it, but he sits down next to me and he's striking a conversation and he asked me, <clears throat> so what do Chinese people eat for breakfast? And in that moment, I had so many thoughts of just how do I answer this question? Do I be as short as I want to be? Do I go do I try and have this be a teaching moment to maybe expand his view of the world or just say like hey you know yeah like a lot of Asian people we like to eat you know rice and fish for breakfast or like maybe a, a rice porridge or I don't know some like my mom likes to make me a Vietnamese sandwich because sir I'm actually not Chinese I'm Vietnamese but at that moment I had so many thoughts going through my head and I just decided on that this would be the moment where I really choose not to be an other. And I told him like, sir, most days I eat milk and cereal. <laughs> <laughs> and I think he may have realized his mistake at that point and the conversation didn't continue. But from that moment, I decided that I didn't have to choose between being Asian or American, but rather that I would always be in between by, by hook or by crook. I would always like, I would never, 
I, I was always going to be seen as Asian, but I could, and I could never really assimilate fully towards one or the other. And I could represent as much as I want, but there's part of me that like still wanted this great American experience. And so I decided that I would live my life within that hyphen. That hyphen is the bridge of my Asian Americanness because I cannot choose one or the other. Both must exist. And that the tie that is the hyphen must always be there for me. Nice. Woohoo. That was just over a little bit of three minutes. Perfect oh. timing, y'all. This is great. Awesome. Living in between the hyphen. I love uh, the way that you articulated that. So I would love to hear a little bit more, Michael, because it seems like this is one of those stories that could be, because I could have a lot of different meanings mm -hmm. and a lot of different kind of takeaways. Mm -hmm. um, could you share with us a little bit more about what uh, it felt like or what it meant like before this moment, maybe just being unhyphenated? Um, it very much felt as an either or. Um, when I stepped into the threshold of my house, I was stepping into an Asian space. Okay. I spoke Vietnamese, I ate Vietnamese food. My furniture is wooden carved benches with dragons on it. Um, but <laughs> then even going to my next door neighbor's house or just stepping outside, I was stepping into a very Americanized world. Like I like to joke that my neighbors were the waspiest of wasps that ever lived. Like they were the Johnsons from Iowa who had, three beautiful kids, two girls, one, bo uh, one boy, and they had a golden retriever named Skippy. <laughs> <laughs> and so it, the, the dichotomy was always very relevant in my mind, but also just like, I never felt othered. I never felt like being in Southern California, especially, it was just my, my food, my people were always within arm's reach if I wanted to. Okay, great. I'm gonna pause you for a quick second. So, so far, who, who here can see and feel the setup? The Vietnamese household, the wooden, you know, the, the food, right? We, we kind of like see, we got a clear image that this is, this is home, this is outside of home. It's a clear dichotomy between Vietnamese and the waspy neighbors with the golden retriever and the picket white fence, right? Great, great setup. Um, and, then, um, and then share with us um, the after. What did it mean to now be a hyphen, hyphenated American or a hyphen? Um, it felt like I almost that I couldn't live life so naive anymore in that like maybe within this bubble of Southern California, I could be safe. I could be like surrounded by the familiar, but in the rest of the, the country, there was still a lot of work to be done for me to be recognized and for me to just not be Asian tourists, that mm. I wasn't just passing through, that I belonged here. Right, right. Did you feel a sense of obligation at all or did you feel like you were cornered in this moment to have to do this? Um, in a way, yes, because like it wasn't the first time like I, that was kind of especially that trip was um, the last of like several like of my little American great American adventure um, and so that diner experience that I had mentioned before were just like the first time I almost experienced the feeling of racism um, was like it had put those thoughts in my mind and then I kind of I knew these things existed but I'd never faced them face like up front and so it did almost feel like a this is what I've trained for or this is what I understood and it's you never think to like you'll need to use your you know CPR training for instance but when that moment happens you just almost feel like it's a fight or flight and I had to fight at that moment. Harish I saw that you had your hand up uh, did they have a comment or a question? Um. Yeah, first of all, Mike, I like to say we eat eggs and rice. 
in fish yes. too. <laughs> so you connect with the story, you're resonating. Yes, yes, yes. But also too, I can resonate because I grew up in a multicultural environment. My best friend's Cambodian and our next door neighbors were Vietnamese and Cambodian and Chinese mixed. Mm -hmm. And we live next door to them so long that our families are like this. Mm -hmm. So, but the thing of it is, is I wanted to ask you, is it so much that you, it's not that you haven't experienced uh, racism, but you are in a moment where you are isolated and realize that racism really does exist outside of your bubble. I think that's probably a better way of putting it. And especially, so I grew up in Long Beach um, and it's, you know, it's long been touted as one of like the most, one of the most diverse cities in America, this and that. And it, I experienced maybe schoolyard racism or maybe racism that I never really internalized or felt, especially with the privilege of being Asian. There's the whole model minority myth that we don't need to get into and all that. But um you know, it was jokes like, quote unquote, innocent ching chong jokes. Hmm. But now it's like, <laughs> yes, quote unquote. Yeah. You know, That's but, not innocent. It's, it's, it's not. But at that time, it, I didn't, it never felt racist yet. And then it wasn't until then where I really learned what, that it wasn't so innocent, that those sentiments underlied something bigger. Mm, mm. And I love how, when we, when we go through this process, just how you were questioning, um, you know, Michael about this process, so much of what we do when we're trying to figure out the stories is to be able to articulate it either to somebody who is a new listener or to articulate it back to ourselves. So we can figure mm -hmm. out what are the holes or what are the things that I might not be um, fully articulating or what might be the holes in, in this story. So one of the first things I want to encourage everybody to do when you're going through this process is most of us have smartphones these days, right? Um, or I'm assuming most of us do. Um, but one of the tools that you can use is always like a voice recorder or a voice memo to first record yourself, get a sense how long is, is this story going for, right? So kind of get a sense of like, how long is it going for? And then if you listen back to yourself, I know it's hard. I, I know it's hard. I always, I have a hard time listening back to myself as well. Um, but when you listen back to yourself, sometimes you can, you can feel your own energy. You can say like, mm, this isn't really making sense. Or, you know, like this is kind of going long. Like, how do I shorten this down? Um, or you could try that out with somebody else if you don't have um, a, a voice memo or, you know, you have a willing ear. So the first thing to do is to try to, to test out some of this, this concepts, right? Um, the second thing to think about is your audience. Every single story that we wanna share, a lot of times we think it's about us. In reality, the stories that we're sharing are in service of our audience because we really want them to do something, to believe something, to change something. You know, Yes, the story takes place because we've been through it, but oftentimes it's, it, we want to think of it as, a, as an offering or as, a, as, a, as um, an act of, of, of kindness, of love to be able to express ourselves. Um, because ultimately we never know who's listening and how that might affect them, right? So, um, um, so thank you, first of all, Michael, for, for sharing that story. Um, that was truly wonderful. Um, and I hope that, uh, you know, I hope that a lot of you are also thinking about like those times that you stepped it in, that you started to step into your own identity, into your own hyphen. You know, I know for, for myself growing up uh, first generation, my family's from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and uh, for the longest time, I was kind of confused as to what to call myself uh, because you know, friends of all different races, backgrounds would come to the, my, my house, ask, are you your parents speaking English? It's like, yeah, I was speaking English. It's just with a, a, a little bit of a twangy twang, you know? And I didn't know how to explain, like we're, we're black, we're just island black, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so, and so like, I'm a Caribbean American, I'm an African American, even though this is the first time that we've lived in this country. 
Um, so you, you'll see like all these different stories start to overlap um, feelings and emotions that we all go through as humans overlap. And then we can start to move the narrative forward, right? So I wanna take a moment to talk about some of the ways that we've been able to use the stories and how we can start to pivot them to use them for advocacy once we figured out how much time we have, once we figure out who our audience is and what our objective is with the story. Um, any questions before um, bringing out a couple of samples that Noelle Lynn's gonna help me with? Okay, great, Noelle Lynn. All right, can you all see this slide? Okay, so I'm gonna give you some examples of folks that have gone through this uh, storytelling and leadership training. So this woman, her name is Angela Edward, and we went through a series of story public story shares um, with her. Um, and her story, the first one, was a very personal story about her father and all the struggles that he faced as a Kofa migrant from Micronesia and um, his inability to access health care. And so she painted a very vivid picture about what happens to these communities um, after the 1996 Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act or Welfare Reform, as some of you might know it, strip COFA communities of their eligibility for most federal benefits, including Medicaid. So when she first shared the story, she was really doing it to raise awareness because a lot of folks actually didn't know that this was an issue that was happening to these communities. And so that was her main, um, I guess her main call to action was, I'm simply here to raise awareness. And then she shifted. And when she started to tell his story at legislative visits, she would adapt it. And this is to some of the questions that we were hearing earlier. She found the parts that were really important for her to share. Some of the difficulty and what does it mean for someone who doesn't have Medicaid? What are they doing now to address their issues? Like, let's say, for example, a chronic condition like diabetes. Um, and instead, she used it as a call to action to ask for support of a, a specific bill that would extend benefits to COPA migrants. So this is all to say you can expand and you can hone your story depending on the audience. But what I want to point out is that no matter what, she always appealed to the values of family, fairness, and health. All right, so that that is what stays the same. It's it's basically the length and then the details that you change. The other interesting thing that Angela did, as you can see here, um, and I encourage you to go listen to her podcast. She was so inspired by this process that she created her own podcast. And um, it was a way for her to take the learnings of how do you develop a story arc and she worked with other people to share their stories. Um, and this was in, in particular because she wanted the younger generation of Micronesians to be able to learn um, the stories of their community. But it was also a really fascinating way for her to quickly mobilize her community around certain actions. So as you can see here, um, this is on one of her recent podcasts. Um, she did a whole episode just on this new bill called CIFA. And um, she would bring people on to talk about the, the impact of it. So that's Angela's um, story. The next example that I wanted to show you is Lanvin. So Lanvin is from Seattle, Washington. And his first story was also a personal story, but it was about his grandfather, who was a World War II uh, Filipino veteran. And the challenges that he faced as an aging veteran um, and also other aging veterans. He also shared some of the stories of other people that he had worked with, but in not getting full recognition and benefits that were entitled to other veterans who fought on the side of the US. So what struck me most about his story is that he would go between this idea about the American dream versus the American reality. And he had painted this picture about his grandpa as a superhero and how do we treat superheroes, especially our elders? So for Lamb, and again, the call to action was raising awareness, maybe of an issue that outside of the Filipino community, maybe some folks don't know about. Um, and then the interesting thing is that he used that story and then he leveraged it during the pandemic to talk about some of the work that he was doing with his organization, the IDIC Filipino Senior and Family Services. 
Um, so what happened, and I'm sure that many of you had experienced this too, you go from having daily activities with your clients face to face, and then suddenly your clients are met with social isolation, being homebound and being vulnerable. So he um, shifted his story to talk about the senior meal delivery program and what they did to try to meet the needs of 600 clients in just a matter of weeks. Um, so his call to action was he literally used his story to call for volunteers and for monetary support. But again, using the same uh, focus around his grandfather's story, which was his values were respect in the role of elders, justice and mutual care. That was the basis of his narrative. So I wanted to highlight, the interesting thing is we're telling you to adapt and adjust but maybe you don't have to. And I'm hoping that you see Lambin's story as inspiration of how you can literally use the same story in different types of medium. So on the top, you see the, the image that says reimagine Seattle. So Lambin took his story word for word and it was um, featured by the city of Seattle Human Services Department. They took his story and they created a blog post they his organization also took his story and it they transcribed it and it became the voiceover of a fundraising video this fundraising video raised a hundred and sixty thousand dollars during the pandemic for their senior meal program and the one thing that i wanted to highlight they didn't apply for any grants they distribute this story out pretty far and wide using social media that a bunch of funders and government agencies basically came to them and saw their work and said, we we're going to give you money. So what are the chances? Most of us are writing grants and we're hoping that people would fund us. So um, I wanted to share these two examples because advocacy could look like many things. You could use video, podcast. It could be to an audience of one, as we were saying today, like maybe you're reaching somebody that needs to hear this and needs to hear you could be your own advocate. It could also be in written form as well. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Noilin. Um, so, like, as we start to like think about like stories, so a we have these these stories, these moments that live inside of us, right? That can be told a billion different ways, from an internal shift, to an external shift, to a worldview shift, right? So we have like these, these moments. Then we have our audience that we need to consider, and the audience will help us inform which way we want to shape this particular story. And then we have the possibility of doing it in multiple different ways, be it in text, um, be it oral, most of what we're focusing on now is oral storytelling um, for advocacy. So I wanna open up, the, up to the floor um, to hear a little bit about where do you think you could potentially use this story or where could you potentially, or what stories would you like to work on or hear from your community uh, as a way to either com build community or build bridges, you know, what potential do you see or where would you like to next take your stories? Are you yeah, I'm opening up to the floor for, you know, for any kind of thoughts or feedbacks. Um, where would you like to do with your story or what do you think would best live? I would like to be a part of TEDx. Hey. That is my dream, but I have not equipped the right tools from my perspective to go forward, but I'm working in the field. I have the story. I need the coaches <laughs> to critique me. And well, that's what I can say to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, to I'll, I'll give a quick soft plug for myself here. Um, actually this morning I was, um, I was, doing a conversation on an app called Clubhouse with the team from TED. Um, so for those of you who don't know, I did a TED talk back in 2013 through a process called the TED Global Idea Search. Uh, once or twice a year, they open up applications for people to submit applications directly to TED, to Big TED. Um, and I went through that process, I got accepted, and now I coach people to refine their ideas because keep in mind that TED is one of those stages that that you know many people aspire to to do and they have also a very specific formula in terms of like what's the idea and how do i present it in a way that it's not only to healthcare workers or not just to mothers but it's actually an idea that a lot of people can implement 
So um, that's actually what I do now. So, um, <laughs> so if anybody's interested in exploring a little bit more about specifically for TED or TEDx, uh, just this morning, I actually got news that one of my participants got into TEDx Ocala, which is in Florida. So, um, and the, the, my commitment to my, to my participants is I fly out to see you. Uh, it's part of the way that I get out of my house, but it's also a way to celebrate. So, <laughs> so if people are interested in anything like that and storytelling for the moth, uh, or for TED or TEDx, um, just um, I'll put my my email in the chat. Um, and feel free to hit me up. I'd love to talk with you about it more. There we go. Oops. Hold on. There we go. My website is, is the same, just donjfraser.com. Um, I should also note that Noi Lynn and I typically do this workshop uh, A in, in person when we're when you know circumstances are allowed for it. Um, uh, but we also do it at different organizations. So if you know if you're interested in doing something very specific for your organization or to try and get a, a, like some type of issue resolved, policy, community building. Um, right now, I'm doing a lot of work with Google um, on uh, an initiative for the people in in Asia as well as North Africa. So that's an initiative that um, that I'm doing a private private workshop for their employees. So there's a lot of different ways that this actual workshop can be delivered. So if anybody's interested in expanding or learning more about that, please feel free to get in touch with myself or Noi Lin. And we can always explore that a little bit more as well. Other thoughts or like what else, uh, what else are you all hoping to do with your stories? Any uh, takeaways, anything else? Yeah, is it, uh, is it Fook? Yes, thank you. You, you said it right. Um, it's very rare for people to um, get my name right. Uh, so thank okay. you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for hosting this workshop. I learned a lot. Um, I'm sorry, sorry that I'm coming late, but um, I, I thank you everyone for sharing your stories um, as well. So I think in the future, what I'd love to do is to utilize the tools that I learned today um, to amplify some of the community health stories that I have seen and have listened to through my community health work uh, in Orange County. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think um, a, lot of, a lot of that's gonna be uh, how uh, getting vaccinated protects some of the undocumented workers um, working in the service sector. And uh, hopefully that would encourage more people to vaccinate. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. In Orange County, has it been difficult to get out the word on, about vaccination or the importance of it? Um, we've sort of reached a flat line in terms of vaccination. So right now we have to really reach to pocket of communities who are either don't believe in COVID or are hesitant um, to get vaccinated. Um, and so a lot of that um, is tied to political affiliation, but also a lot of that is tied to the mistrust with medicine and science gen in general. So um, yeah. yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. And you know, one of the things that we often think about when we're when we're addressing communities, you know, in, in African American, Black, Caribbean American community, there has been a lot of mistrust of medical institutions in general. Um, and so sometimes just the framing of like of understanding why we are mis um, mistrusting, um, but then also realizing that the repercussions in terms of our own communities and the backlash, it's going to come back to to us communities of color. You know those Filipino frontline workers who are the nurses. Uh, you know to the Black and Latino audiences. So there's a lot of ways that we can always frame that story. Uh, so yeah, so just keep in mind the audience and what they might be thinking, believing um, as a result of their own lived experiences, and what story you can best share to amplify why you want to push this type of um, um, agenda forward. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that. Yeah, it's a tricky topic because it is there is. Um, racism in medicine and there's racism in, in science. So the distress is, doesn't just come out in air. There, there's a reason for that. And um, yeah, well, thank you for, for your suggestion. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Anybody else? I know that we're just about a minute over time here. Um, any other comments or thoughts before we before we wrap up? Well, I was going to add, Don, that this is Sarah. I that I hope that honestly that my story would be shared with more healthcare workers to remember that their patients are humans. They're not statistics. They're not just numbers. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Sarah, when you were talking, um, one of the things that reminded me of was an article I came across recently that said that on average, a, a patient is only listened to for about 11 seconds before a doctor or a nurse starts to interject some type of something for them, um, like some type of recommendation. And that I've been starting to follow a lot more of this idea of narrative medicine. So what it means for to actually like give space for that person to actually share their story, to share like their thoughts, what's happening inside of them, um, as opposed to constantly interjecting. Um, because uh, like, like I said, so many of you had these stories about feeling like you were not heard during this process of either giving birth or of like serving, s serving somebody in an ER or whatever that, that sentiment might be, right? So I think that there's a lot of opportunities for you to share and for many of you to share these kind of stories in a way that people need to hear. Um, because a lot of times, you know, we think, of, oh, that's my doctor, the doctor has the answer or, you know, or the doctor knows what's best. And that might not always be the case as we started to see, mm -hmm. right? So I'm hoping that you do share your story as it, as um, uh, with audiences that you know that you feel might need to hear it to start to drive that needle forward because there's so much opportunity and so much potential. I have a quick question for Sarah Don, if you don't mind. Of course. Um, I know that um, some of our clients have uh, from our organization ha has had similar experiences, and I just had a question for Sarah. Sarah, where do you think that? dismissiveness comes from like where does it stem from because it seemed like it doesn't just happen i mean obviously it happens statistically more to um people of color but um you know it also happens to mm -hmm. all people so do you where do you do you have an opinion about uh where you think that stems from um i think it some of it stems from just the way they're trained um it's very statistical and logical and you follow you look at it, you look at the symptoms and then you make a diagnosis. Um, I think they have to, to start looking at doing medicine differently. I will also say that I don't doubt for a second that burnout um, in our current healthcare system plays a significant role. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, as I said, I, I was work I wanted to be this great gun ho ICU nurse, but the ho hospitals were brutal. They, they take a lot out of you. Um, so I can also emphasize that you're working, you know, 12, 13 hour shifts, sometimes four or five days a week. It's, it's real hard to, to remember that this person who's taking up more of your time is still a person and, need, and needs that time because you're, you've got 15 other million things that you're thinking about what you need to do and um, I don't, I'm not a big fan of the way our healthcare system is set up. Mm. I, I don't know if you could hear, but she said, thank you. <laughs> well, you're very welcome. <laughs> thank you for asking. I don't, I don't share that a lot, but that is my, my personal opinion, my experience. Um, and I would really like to see change in my lifetime. That's why we're here telling stories, right? Yeah finding out the overlap and the ways that, that we can change some things. Great, great. Anybody else would like to share any thoughts, any feelings? We got a couple of comments in the, the chat, so I'm just gonna quickly read it. So, okay. um, Bao Li, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. Um, happy storytelling all, sto sharing our stories is so impactful. Thank you all for sharing. And Miriam wrote, thank you all for the interesting stories that are so human. I think my impression is that we need to speak up and speak out. I, I agree. I think if there's anything that I got from this session is the importance of speaking up and being your own advocates and speaking up for others. Absolutely. One of my favorite sayings whenever we close is that 
if you don't share your story, who will? Yeah. You know, somebody else might might go ahead and jack that story and reframe it in a way that's not intended. Um, one of the things I've been working a lot on this past year is what happens when a story that you've been told is a lie, <laughs> um, which is a whole nother, whole <laughs> other session. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, but you need to share that story because it's your it's your lived experience, and we want to be able to know how to um, how to advocate, how to be in community with one another, how to listen to each other's experiences, mm -hmm. how to respect each other's experiences, right? So. Yeah, and you also don't know who needs to hear your story. There could be somebody right. in this audience that needed to hear it. Um, and it's touching them in such a deep way that maybe we will never even know. So go ahead and keep sharing your stories. That is so true. I just want to say when I first started this workshop, I had no idea about what was going to take place. And nobody knows that secretly I want to be a public speaker. So for me to be in this space, it's like I'm right on time, but also too, to hear other people's stories and actually be in tune with how I'm responding to it. It, it kind of like opens up my eyes because I'm, I, I feel, I empathize with a lot of people because I know the story. I've grown up in multicultural environments where I've seen these different stories, but when you hear someone tell it versus seeing it and being there present, it takes on a different spin and it gives you a different perspective. So I appreciate being here. I'm grateful to be here now because like I had no idea. I was just like, oh yeah, the, I'm gonna be in this storytelling workshop. I, I tell stories all the time, but to have to break it down and stop and start and reflect. I thought this, this is really good. So Thank you. So appreciate that. Thank you so much. I'm going to <laughs> echo that and I will tell, I have told so many people this is the best workshop I have been in in a very long time. Hey, awesome. Thank you for that, Sarah. What, what was it that worked for you or what was it that really kind of resonated for you? Um, I don't, I don't know. I think just the way you talk. So I, there is a push in my, in my office to, to get more people to do this. There's talking about sharing stories about doing, we've been practicing these like three minute Ted talks and we want to get out the story of the work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a big fan of public speaking. And I've never been someone that wanted to, to speak, but the, the idea of sharing stories, you know, if you don't share it, who will, who's going to share your story? This is your story. Right. And if you have a way to make an impact and a change, it's not even about, this is what I want. It's, it's I, I need to do this. It's the right thing to do. Right. Right. No, I love that. And I, I also love the fact that your office is taking the initiative to start to share those stories. Um, to create the space to do that. Uh, it's something that I've definitely started to see a lot more of within workspaces is understanding what are the true intentions, the motivations of our employees and the goals of this organization moving forward. And the best way to articulate that is like, what is the story that we want to put forth? Like, you know, like a lot of people look at the, the model of like the Martin Luther King speech, for example. Today, this is what we, this is how society is. Little black boys can't engage with little white girls. But there's a vision for the future. This is how we want to shape that future. This is what, what this is what it looks like. Leaning into all those different senses. Today we're not there, but tomorrow on the horizon we will be. Those are all parts of the stories that we utilize for advocacy, for vision, for change. So it's great to see that 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 your organization is starting to adopt it. Um, you know, if there's any way we can help to continue to push that forward, um, <laughs> let us know. Absolutely. Yeah, I just want to be mindful of time. We're 11 minutes over and I know that you are all busy. So we are going to wrap it up. Um, I don't know if there's any other burning desire to speak. This is a storytelling workshop. So I'm putting it out there one more time. If there's any last words that anybody wanted to share. Can I come back? <laughs> you gotta ask the health forum. We're Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm everyone. Sure. There she is. There she is. 
Thank we just want to say everyone, um, you have our contact info. So if we could be of any support, please reach out to us. And um, thank you so much for being so open to the process and for sharing your stories. Thank you all. You all were amazing. So appreciate it. And be in touch. Keep calm and story on. Thank you. <laughs> Which is an actual website, by the way, if you all want to check it out, keep common story on is, uh, is my website. So check it out. <laughs> Thank you.